So just starting, uh, explaining a little bit who we are. Um, we are Marcel and Anat. So I am Anat Geiger and I have been, um, I would like to see the, the picture, Carrie. Can we have a picture of us? Yeah. We're gonna, yeah, I put the functional yoga teacher training. That's the name of the training <laughs> that we had for many, many years. Marcel and I have met actually um, in uh, 2005, I think it was. So it's quite a long time ago. And we actually came from very different backgrounds in yoga. And we met into this yoga studio at, in Amsterdam called the Yoga Garden. We have both been asked by the owner of the studio to teach there. And I need to tell you that... Um, stop this uh, presentation it's going a little bit fast yes so we are both asked by uh, the owner of the studio to teach at the studio and this was a time when there were almost no yoga studios anywhere so it's hard nowadays to, to imagine that but we uh, I think there were like something like five or six yoga studios in the whole of Amsterdam so it was quite a special thing to be asked to teach somewhere and Marcel and I we met both we were both teachers there he was just starting I had been doing this for a while by then I started doing yoga at 96 so it's been a long time and um, we actually did not get along very well in the beginning because he was coming from a completely different uh, yoga background and I was very strict I did a lot of alignment and I had a lot of lots of rules and regulations on how things should be done and he was coming from Ashtanga much freer uh, style and it took us a while to actually stop and talk to each other <laughs> and when we talked to each other we actually uh, really like each other and we started working together quite soon uh, in teacher trainings we started offering teacher trainings in 2008 and it kind of developed from there it started very differently very differently than it is now and our our trajectory in yoga has been very funny because he came from this kind of free uh, style of yoga and I came from this very strict one and we kind of crossed each other in the middle and I went more and more towards functional and you know trying to understand that there is a different kind of practice for every single body that is out there and he actually went into a much more strict much more aligned base kind of yoga and the great thing is that during this whole process we always kept really good communication between us and um six years ago he also decided or the five years ago he also decided to go to my teachers Paul and Susie Greedy who teach functionally and since then our teacher trainings have changed again completely now, our studio in Amsterdam, after 15 years, we decided to um, put a stop to it. It was kind of really taking a lot of our attention all the time and our energy. And we are now focusing more on the trainings. And we decided to change the name of the trainings for the functional yoga teacher training because it is what we teach. Now, this functional yoga teacher training, our teacher trainings and our classes too and the workshops that we teach, they are actually based on three basic concepts or three basic pillars, the three things that we think that they they are or they should be it doesn't want to sound dogmatic but they are the the very basis of what yoga practice and yoga studies is and the first one is anatomy and not so much anatomy in the sense of you have to know learn all the names of the muscles and the bones by heart that is just really scratching the surface it's not even the most important thing at all but anatomy in the sense of understanding how a body moves bodies are made to move physical bodies and bodies in general they are made to move uh, we associate movement with life actually when a body starts moving or any part of your body starts moving quite soon that part starts to deteriorate so it is super important to know that um, how your your body moves and how your specific body moves because it's not going to be the same as your friends and your teachers it's going to be different because we are all different we're going to talk about that in a moment so anatomy is the basis of understanding the postures if, if you are going to be a teacher you're definitely going to have to study anatomy because you're going to have to be able to look at other people's bodies and understand mm, that need to be adjusted or adapted or modified in some way but also for your own practice to really learn to listen to your body instead of having an outside authority telling you what to do. And then knowing anatomy is going to make you much more able to use your body in a smart, safe and pleasant way. That's the first pillar. So anatomy includes learning the poses and understanding what the poses are supposed to do for you and for your students if you are a teacher. The second pillar is philosophy. And I am... Um, I'm always impressed how the word philosophy puts people off. I think people associate philosophy with an academic kind of thing that is very uh, uninteresting or very intellectual. 
And yoga philosophy is actually the opposite of that. Yoga philosophy is all about life, all about how you deal with the challenges that come in your life, how you deal with other people, how you deal with yourself. You need a kind of a, a, a background of information to understand because it's so easy to become angry. It's so easy to uh, just focus, to be selfish. Those things, especially in the time that we are... Um, that we are living right now, these things are pulling us all the time. And if we are to live a life that is more fulfilling, a life that is more satisfying, a life that is going to actually um, sustain us and, and, and be joyful and be loving, we're going to have, we're going to need to understand a certain, certain things. We're going to have to be able to think and investigate certain aspects of ourselves and of life in general. And yoga philosophy really offers us that. It has nothing to do with an intellectual effort of dry concepts in your head this is completely uh, it might have a, a hint of that if this is your inclination but yoga philosophy is all about the heart is all about learning having tools to investigate your behavior we need that's the, the, the actually this is the most important part of yoga is to learn to investigate our behavior to learn to investigate the patterns that we are stuck with and that keep on taking us into places of suffering and of regret and learn to which are the tools which are the practices that are going to help us to make certain changes some certain tweaks and and bends here and there so that we can slowly change change those patterns that are not helping us anymore and that's the whole point of yoga philosophy and then finally, the third pillar is practice, because there is no theory is going to give us anything if it's not applied, if it's not put into a practice. So practice of asana, for sure, practice of meditation, in much more even, uh, but also the practice of how do I speak? How do I act in the world? How do I um, control my anger, control my appetite? control my selfishness so the practice of all these beautiful principles that we are learning both in anatomy and in philosophy needs to be put to practice and then we with that practice we go back to our studies like okay but I'm always getting stuck on that place what do the yogis talk about this so I always get stuck in that pose what does that show me anatomy so these three pillars they actually um, feed each other they're never going to be completely separate they are separate in the sense when you study we need to have time to study anatomy and time to study philosophy and time to practice but they are feeding each other all the time those are the three pillars of our teacher training and then today we just want to take you a little bit into the main idea of uh, functional yoga why do we call our teacher training the functional yoga teacher training uh, when we talk about functional, the mo main thing you have to understand is that the opposite of functional yoga is aesthetic yoga. And aesthetic yoga is the yoga where you are constantly trying to make a specific shape. So um, my, you know, your, your, yesterday I went to take a yoga class at my gym here in Rio. I'm in Rio right now. And the woman kept on saying that I'm doing downward facing dog, you know, and my second finger has to point forward. Or my middle finger has to point forward. Or my, this finger in between my second and my middle finger have to point forward without looking at what kind of body do I have? What kind of shoulders do I have? What, do, what is happening to my back? It's just this very aesthetic principle that everybody is the same and everybody should, should be responding to the same rules. And in functional yoga, we actually, the first premise of functional yoga is what you can see in the screen right now. Every bone in everybody is different. I put there the pictures of three skulls of three perfectly normal human beings. And you can see that um, their heads are different, the eye sockets are different, their jaws are different, their sides of the, head, the back of their heads, everything about bones, if you want to analyze them, is different. And this is true for every single bone in your body. Your arm, the bone of your arm, the humerus, the bone that forms your arm, may be completely different than the bone, my, the bone that forms my arm. That is true for every bone. Bones grow in spirals. Some people have a lot of spirals. Some people have less spirals. Some people spiral the other direction. Some people have uh, the, at the end of the bone goes in one direction so people have another there is huge variation in human anatomy much more than those plastic models of skeletons that we uh, look at or pictures of anatomy that we look at and make us believe and that's what this presentation is going to show you just in a couple of um, uh, slides this variation in human anatomy that's where we're going to go now 
So the next picture, Carrie, are you there? The next picture, thank you. <laughs> the next picture is, uh, this is uh, two pelvi. Pelvi is the plural of pelvis. One pelvis, two pelvi. And then if you look at them kind of briefly, sure, they're the same structure, right? They both have the same structures in them. Um, they both have, they have the, the sit bones at the, at the bottom there and they have these uh, big kind of uh, Mickey Mouse ear-like shapes at the top where uh, there are hip bones on the top. So if you look quickly, you're always going to think that they are the same. But if you just zoom in a little bit and you pay attention, you're going to see that everything about these hips or this pelvis is different. The thing that I want to show you the most in this one is the hip sockets. The hip sockets is this kind of, we call it the acetabulum, this kind of socket where the head of your femur, the head of your thigh bone is going to go into really like a ball and socket joint, which is actually the name this, this, bone, this uh, joint has. So uh, Carrie, I don't know if you can take your cursor to the hip sockets and show them because I don't have, yeah, so you can show where the hip sockets are. So a little bit more to the side, yeah, there. So if you look at the hip sockets right there and this one, and then you look at the hip sockets of the other guy, they're bo both men, by the way, they're both men. And then you go to the, and then you see that they are completely different. The guy on your left, on the left of the screen, the hip sockets are pointing forward and they are pretty kind of a little bit forward and out as it were, exactly. And then if you go to the guy on the right of the screen, they are pointing down. These sockets, these, these uh, hip sockets are pointing down. So the way that these two men are going to move their legs is going to be completely different. The, the shape they are going to take when they move the legs, the guy on the left when he takes his leg up and the guy on the right when he takes his leg up, it's going to look completely different. They are not going to both be able to do the same poses if you're speaking in terms of yoga. It's going to look different. Even if they feel the same, they're going to be, look completely different. And if you put them exactly in the same pose and they're going to look the same, they're going to feel completely different things because their bones is different. Um, it's very complicated now to get if we have, you know, if you actually have a femur bone and I can show you that, for instance, the guy on the right of the screen is going to be able to spread his legs way wider than a guy on the left of the screen because his hip sockets are way more out to the sides than the guy on the left. The guy on the left has his hip sockets much more to the front and the guy on the right, even though they are pointing down, they are way more to the sides. So the first yoga class that these two guys go in, the guy on the right, knowing nothing else about his life, about his femur or about how flexible he is, just looking at his pelvis, I can predict that the guy on the right is probably going to be able to spread his legs way wider than a guy on the left. So there is nothing about the practice, nothing about the flexibility. It's simply the bones, the way they are made for this guy. And if you don't know that, you're going to keep correcting the guy on the left <laughs> forever. <laughs> and he's only going to get frustrated and probably leave class or get hurt if he's too aggressive. And he's never going to look like the guy on the right. And this is true for every bone and body. I'm going to give you another example. It's the next slide. Yes, so these two are femur bones. The femur is the name that we give to the thigh bone. It's the longest bone in our bodies. Um, it, one end, end of it goes into the hip and the other end makes the knee joint. So what you're looking at is the head of the femur, we call it, is this ball thing there. It's the head of the femur. Yeah, Carrie's showing you there is the cursor. That's the head of the femur. And then what comes right after the head of the femur is the neck of the femur. And then you can see that the, the guy on the left, the neck of the femur makes a, a, an angle that it's almost 90 degrees. It's actually 100, we measured it, or 110. But it's almost 90 degrees there. And if you look on the guy on the right, he, the neck of his femur is making an angle of almost, what is it, 45 degrees. So they have a huge difference in, in, in the, we call it the inclination of the femur. If the femur is going to go like this into the socket, so this head of the femur is gonna go into the socket that we just looked at, or if it's going to make an angle like that and go into the socket. So I can already tell you, again, without knowing anything about these guys, without knowing how flexible they are, how long they've been doing yoga, how, I only know that they're both healthy, they have no pathology there. I can tell you that the guy on the right is going to lift his leg way higher 
than the guy on the left. The guy on the right has the the moment he's gonna get he has his leg way out to the side when he gets to that 90 degree angle he already has lifted his leg a lot so he's going to have a lot of extra angles degrees to lift his leg than the guy on the left the guy on the left is going to hit and maybe this is something important to say he's going to hit compression compression is when two bones in your body hit each other so like i'm doing here right now it happens in our bones all the time so i take my arm up and up and up and a certain point the bone of my arm is going to hit the bone of my shoulder blade and then the mov movement finishes the moment you hit compression in your body that's the end of your movement it has nothing to do with flexibility we call it as a joke uh, we i mean uh, paul Greeley, my teacher paul and susie Greeley, they call it the skeletability <laughs> so not flexibility but skeletability if you have the bones for it you can maybe take your arm endlessly back if you don't have the bo have the bones for it you're going to hit compression very soon so i can tell you that the guy on the right is going to hit compression way later than the guy on the left and again only because he was born with an inclination a femur inclination of this kind much uh, more inclination than the guy on the left so i hope it's clear please write your questions there i already see there are a couple of questions there so for for you guys which who, who came later carrie told us just keep on um writing your questions on the q a that's there on the bottom of your of your screen and we're gonna get to them uh at the end of the presentation okay so let's go for the next one and then we come to the we come to the next um premise of functional yoga the first one is every bone and everybody is different so uh, you just saw it i gave you two examples but i could give you examples of all the bones in your body of your upper arm lower arm lower leg your vertebrae your everything every single bone in your body is different from the bones of any other person you take not two people in this world are exactly the same the variation in human anatomy is simply astounding. I've been looking at teach, uh, students in teacher trainings literally for 12 years now, comparing them, looking at them. It's in amazing. The variations, I'm still amazed that sometimes you see people that can or cannot do things that you don't believe. And the second premise of our functional, your functional yoga is the, the sentence that is now, what is easy for one skeleton is impossible for another. So if you, like all of us has struggled with the pose and you've been doing yoga for you know anything more than three years in my opinion if you've been doing yoga reasonably regularly for three years and there is a pose you just can't not do i suggest you investigate the possibility that it is in your bones that it is compression that one bone is hitting another bone and you're just not going to be able to do it. I keep on having people, you know, on both the sites where I teach, both the Fat Yogis and on uh, Eckhart Yoga where I teach, I keep on getting questions from people saying, how do I, I never can, I'm very stiff on my right hip and I can never do the same angle as you can. What can I do? And I always think like, why do you think you're stiff? Maybe you're not stiff at all. Maybe your bones are just not going to go there. And this possibility is at the same time, sometimes a little confronting, you know? So for instance, when I had to understand, some people get confronted when they have to understand that they won't do lotus pose, but sometimes it's incredibly liberating because you can actually focus on your practice, on the deliciousness of it, instead of worrying about aesthetically doing a pose. So now we're gonna show you a couple of, a couple of um, examples of people actually doing poses and why they look so different. So can we go back just one more, Carrie, so that I can explain what they are looking at. So what you're looking at, what I want you to pay attention on these two pelvi is the bone right on top of the hip socket. So if you look on the guy on the left, you can see his hip sockets. And right off the socket, you see that the hip socket has kind of a lip to it. It's kind of deep. The edges of the hip socket, they stick out a little bit. So with the head of, so if you, this is the hip socket, the, the head of the edges stick out a little. It means that the head of the femur is gonna go deeper into the socket. And right on top of that, there is a bone protrusion that is right on top of that hip socket. And if you move over to the guy on the right, you're gonna see that there is a much less deep hip socket. He doesn't have these deep kind of mouths out and that he doesn't have that same protrusion right on top of it. So um, 
I hope you can understand what I mean. It's right there between the femur and the hip itself. Now, if you go to the next uh, picture, you're gonna see that when these two people, more or less, stretch their legs straight out in front of them and then bend over, in the case of Mariah, this she's the woman on the right, she, you can see in the right next to the Mariah on the right there, we made, has a little picture with a little arrow. Yes, it's right there. So the, 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 the outside of the acetabulum of the hip socket, it has so much bone in it that it is hitting the femur right there. And even her hip bone, you know, the hip bones are these two hips, these two bones that stick out here at the bottom of our hips. You cannot see. I'm trying to show it on myself, but you cannot see. Her hip bone is also incredibly protruding. I have tested it myself. So when she comes forward, her bones just hit one another. And this has been her Paschimottanasana. It's the name of this pose. This has been her pose for more than 10 years. She's a yoga teacher. She has done yoga for more than 10 years. By the time she made this picture, she was already doing yoga. This has already this been, this is a column I made for the yoga magazine in Holland. It's written in Dutch um, a long time ago. So by the time she was already doing, and this is the max she can go into this picture, into this pose. And if you ask her, okay, Mariah, where do you feel this pose? What do you think normally? Why do we do this pose? What is the function? That's the way of thinking functionally. What is the function of this pose? You could say it's to stretch the back of your thighs, or you could say it's to stretch your back, the muscles at the back. And if you ask her, where do you feel this? She's going to point at her groin. She's going to point at her hip bones and say like, I don't feel anything in my back. I don't feel anything at the back of my thighs. I only feel here at the front. And this is a clear sign that this pose has no function for her whatsoever, apart from irritating her and maybe even harming her. Whereas if you go look at Eveline, who's a journalist there on the left she can flop herself forward easily and she could do that very soon as, as soon as she started it she was always very she always had a lot of range of motion and she could always do this pose she, she has a great stretch it's not that she doesn't have she get a great stretch but she can aesthetically it looks like she's doing the pose correctly and it looks like mariah is doing the pose badly but that's an aesthetic judgment if you actually ask them what they are feeling that then becomes functional and if mariah actually tells me there is no reason for me to do this pose i don't feel relaxation here i don't feel a stretch here i don't i cannot there is nothing for me in this pose apart from irritation and pain and so in a functional approach to yoga i when i give a pose i say i want you to feel for instance the back of your thighs and then she together we have figured out another pose that does stretch the back of her thighs and that's what she does she never does this pose this pose gives her nothing a functional yoga class gives you this possibility of finding the pose that gives you the function you want to achieve instead of just doing the pose because it's in the script so let's do one more of those what is the next one these are photos of the vertebrae the lumbar vertebrae those are the five vertebrae of your lower back uh, there are two different people. There's a guy here. They're all men because these bones were all made for men. This guy here on the left and the guy on the right. What I want you to look at, Carrie, yeah, maybe you can go there with your cursor, is the space, this, this bit of the bone that is on the bottom there where the guy is lying down. This is the body of the vertebrae. So you have to imagine that these two men are lying on their bellies, okay? And the back, the, the front of their bodies is on the floor and the back is pointing up towards the ceiling. Now, if you can look at these little bony things that stick out, we call them the dinosaur bones, just to make sure. If you look at the space between them in the guy on the left, it's quite a bit of space there. And if, yeah, this one is even bigger because that second one is kind of lower. So there is a huge space between the first and the third vertebra where you are. So if you go over this little one here, all the way to the other guy, to the other guy just pass, yeah. So this is a huge bit of, uh, no, go back where you were. <laughs> I just want to show that between the, the second vertebra is a little lower. So it means that between the first and the third vertebra, you have a lot of space there. You can bend backwards endlessly. This guy can bend backwards a lot. Knowing nothing if he's flexible, if he does yoga. Whereas the guy on the right, if you look at the space between his bones, it's tiny. And even if you go on and you go like in between the first and the second vertebra there, all the way to the right, all the way to the right, there he's already in compression. Even before he started back bending, he's still lying on his belly, he's already getting compression. 
So I can predict, again, without knowing anything about them, is that the guy on the right, where he lived, <laughs> he was, he had very little back then. He would go, it's the people who go a little bit into a back then, like, ow. Well, as the guy on the left to say, what's your problem? I can go endlessly. So if you look at two people, that's more or less what you're going to see who have these bones. That's the next, uh, next slide. The guy on the left, it's our friend Ehud. He's also from the Fat Yogis. And then you, he, we always joke with him that he has no bones whatsoever because his range of motion is just astounding. And he can, this is not even, he could put his head on his feet, no problem at all. And I tell you, he, Ehud has been doing yoga with me for more or less 14 years. Um, he came to class three times a week for 14 years. And he was already like this when he started. He learned control and he learned strength. He learned a lot in these 14 years, but this calatability, this range of motion, he already had. Whereas the guy on the right, oh no, is also a yoga teacher. Really nice guy, very fit, very, um, we call it a healthy, happy man. He just doesn't have the range of motion. He hits compression very, very soon. And then it's a tendency of people to think that the guy on the right is doing less good yoga than the guy on the left. But again, that's an aesthetic judgment. If you ask Anna what he feels, he feels a wonderful compression in his back when he does that. He loves it. And it's doing him a lot of good to do it. He just doesn't look as spectacular as it who does on the left. Do we have one more? Or was it it? Yeah, that's the one I wanted to get through. And this one is a little bit harder to understand, so please bear with me. You are looking at your shoulder blade. We call it a scapula in Latin. And you're looking at it from the side, so that's why it's a little bit hard to understand. But I hope that you can help me and uh, Carrie, be ready there with your cursor. Because what you are looking at, what I want you to look at is this bone that is sticking here at the back. It's called the acromion process. Yes, that's the one. And then you can see that this guy here has an acromion process that it's way more to the back. Exactly. And then if you move to the guy on the right, this acromion process is, is actually reaching a little bit more over the shoulder itself. The shoulder is going to be here where you see, can you show the shoulder joint? It's where, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's where the, your humerus, the head of your arm, is going to go to form the shoulder joint on both guys now try to understand with me what's going to happen if the guy on the right if you ask the guy on the right to take his arm up like this his arm is going to go up going to go up and when it hits the it's kind of very hard because i'm doing it here but you cannot see uh i'm going to try to do it with my hand so imagine that this is the acromion process right here i'm going to use my uh let's see if i have something that can yes i have a spoon so this is the acromion process this this bone that is going here and then you ask someone to take the arm over the head the acromion process is right there right here on your shoulder so if this acromion process is back you're going to be able to lift your arm this is your arm this is your knife is your arm your arm it's going to go up the arm is going to go up and this when the arm is straight the arm is actually next to your head but if your acromion process is back you're going to be able to keep taking the arm back and it's only going to hit the acromion process when it's back there. So it means that you're going to take the arm, you're right next to your head, you don't feel anything. You can keep on bringing this arm back. Oh, and now I feel the acromion process, you're going to hit it. Now the guy on the right is not so lucky because his acromion process is actually reaching over the, 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 human, the shoulder. So when he takes his arm up, before he even hits his, comes next to his head, he's already hitting compression right there. So he's going to take his arm here and boom, hit compression right there. I hope it's a little clear. Let's see the practicality of it. Next, next slide, please. When do we take the arms up? When we do downward facing dog. We do that all the time. So the left, that's a Sabine. Sabine is incredibly flexible. She has a lot of range of motion. She has flexibility and skeletability. So if you see that, if you look at that little insert there at the bottom of the page on the left, we just asked her to take her arm up and back and look how far she can go. Because the that bone from the scapula is so much back that she can take her arm up, 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 up next to the head and she can continue go back, back, back. And she's only going to hit when she's way back. It's right there. Which means that when she does downward facing dog, she can go really low with her 
chest and put her head down onto the floor. She can play with her arms. She can turn her head, the arms out. She can do whatever it is that the teacher wants her to do. No problem whatsoever. The girl on the right, uh, sorry, the one on the left is Tess. The one on the right is Sabine. If you look at the little insert there on the right, when we ask her to do exactly the same, we ask her to lift the arm up. She cannot take the hair, arm even next to her head because she's gonna hit compression on the bone there on the back already here. And if she does downward facing dog, the same compression is present there. So if you look at this big picture of Sabine here on the right, you can see that her head is not even close to her arms. And actually Sabine had a major shoulder injury from being corrected and being instructed to do certain things that her body is simply not made to do. You can say whatever you want. It's unsafe for her to do the safe alignment rules. Whereas if you ask her to spread her hand, what happens when you spread your hands a little wider? You're actually now bypassing that compression point. And now if you see that little insert right underneath her when she's doing down dog with the hands a little wider, now she can also put her head on the floor and she has no pain in her shoulder, which is the most important thing. We do down a dog. You know why, we, we, why dogs do it in the morning? They do it to open their lung capacity, to open their chests, to open their armpits, to open their shoulders. That's why they do it. And we should be enjoying that enormously. Dogs are not thinking like, oh my God, is my second paw, is my middle of my paw pointing forward? Am I just rolling the sky? They are not thinking about it. They are doing what feels delicious and opening their bodies up. And that's how we should be doing it too. And adjusting, not only in down dog, but in all poses and adjusting the poses to what we need. Of course, it doesn't mean that everything that feels delicious is good. That's the most the criticism that we always get. Uh, sorry about the noise. Uh, it's the criticism that we always get from people. It's like, oh, just do whatever you want. That's not what we mean at all. It's just that learning to feel your body and learning to understand the function of the pose, it's fundamental for this process of yoga practice that is supposed to bring you towards yourself. It's supposed to bring you in contact with who you are, with the body that you have, not the body your teacher has, but the body that you have. It's supposed to bring you in contact with, you know, your, your difficulties, your challenges. How do you react to the challenges? What do you, can you feel your body? Or are you just looking outside of yourself all the time? This is what yoga is supposed to be giving us. And functional yoga is trying to remind us of that. Feel your body. Do you feel your muscles working? Do you feel the restraint somewhere? Do you feel you should go? And the more you feel, the more you're going to be able to divide between I am just lazy and I want to do whatever I want to. Is this good for me? Paul Greedy, my teacher, says the million dollar question is, is this pain good for me? Of course it hurts. Sometimes it hurts because it's the right thing for you to do. And sometimes it hurts because it's the wrong thing for you to do. And a yoga teacher should be helping you answer this question, helping you discern between the pain that is good and the pain that is bad, instead of just, you know, guessing for you and telling you and taking authority over a process that should be your own. All right. So I actually think that, um, just to, to wrap it up, I actually think that this end, this, this, what I'm telling you, I think it's also the beginning of philosophy, our philosophical work. So you do a practice and then you observe, how do I react? How do I feel? Am I competitive? Am I aggressive? Do I get depressed? Do I feel worse than everybody else? Do I feel better than everybody else? Am I comp I'm competing with other people all the time? Those are the questions that are actually going to take us further. The practice itself is to move the energy in our bodies, to move the chi, to create a little bit of strength, a little bit of flexibility, to move the energy so that we are healthy. But those patterns of behavior, they are going to arise in your practice too. If you have an amazing yoga practice, you can do all the poses perfectly and you are, you know, a jerk. <laughs> or you are just completely busy with winning a competition in your head, you're walking backwards. You're not going forward. Whereas if your practice is, you know, whatever it is that you can do, but you are completely connected in your heart with what you are doing and what are the things that you want to improve in yourself, you are a great yogi. We have a student in Amsterdam, you know, that is much older, is very overweight shows up every week who works on himself like crazy for us he is one of our most advanced students even though he can do very little so philosophy anatomy and practice 
the three pillars. That's how we started for you guys who joined us later. Those are the three pillars of our trainings and our classes. Anatomy, learning to understand how your body works, how the body of your students work so that you can help them and help yourself. Philosophy, learning to understand how your mind works, how your heart works, and how you're going to influence it to stop engaging in behavior that brings you grief and maybe creates behavior that gives you satisfaction and fulfillment. And practice, putting all these ideas into a daily practice of observing yourself, working on yourself, and getting a little better. Okay, this is my spiel. I think we should have a look at the questions here. Uh, we only have one question, I think. Do you always adjust hands-on or can you also only use, I don't have the continuation of it, but I can imagine only use verbal cues. I'm guessing that you're ask, asking. Um, I use more verbal cues. I use more verbal cues because adjusting someone manually already means that um, that I am guessing what is good for you. And I want you to go in that direction. And I much rather ask you, how does it feel if you turn your foot a little bit more out? Instead of me going there and turning your foot more out, which is for instance, again, yesterday I went to a yoga class here in Rio, lovely teacher, great person, very well intended, but she was obviously trained by, you know, a place where this, your hand has to be there, your hand has to be there, turn there, turn there. Without asking me what I feel, do you, and I, for me, the verbal cue allows for communication with the student, how I would like you to feel the top of your thigh. So do you, if you bend your knee, do you feel it more? Do you feel it less? If someone tells me, oh, my knee hurts, what happens if you do this? What happens if you do that? But I do think that manual adjustment has a place. I do. I think that sometimes to have someone taking a little deeper into the pose or it makes you relax in a way that you don't if you go alone. Uh, there are poses that are very hard and then having someone helping you get into the pose might give you the thrill of being able to do the pose. So I'm not against it uh, at all. I just think that most of the adjustments that I experienced, that I even learned in my years of alignment yoga and the ones that I experienced are adjustments where the teacher knows what I should be doing and is, is, is forcefully putting me in a position without knowing anything about my body and what I am experiencing in the class. So I tend in general classes to give more, of ver more verbal cues, but I do think that um, hands-on adjustments have their place too. It's a tough one because people love hands-on adjustment. I mean, if you want to make money, just do a workshop hands-on adjustment and meridians. <laughs> it's the hot topics that everybody wants to do. But I actually think that they are overrated. I think that this... To, to include the student in this process of understanding what is happening in the pose is actually fundamental. Great question, by the way. So, uh, any more questions? Is there anything that I would like me to repeat or to explain a little bit more? I know that I tend to speak a little fast. I just don't, didn't want to, I wanted to allow some time for. Just let me know. Understood. Carrie, are you joining us? Yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm still here. I was just going to say, and if anybody <laughs> asks to talk, then you can use the, the hand icon um, and I can unmute your microphone. So if anybody has anything that they actually want to say or if you want to have a conversation in the lab, just let me know. Oh, that's cool. I don't see it, but um, I'm sure that you do. Oh, there is one more question, I think. Can you get too flexible? <sighs> too flexible for what? That's the question. Um, I think that some people, there is also a discussion that comes in a lot, uh, talk about hypermobility. So the people who have a lot of mobility in their joints and it's always seen as something uh, dangerous and problematic. The thing is that hypermobility, it simply means that you have more range of motion in your joints than average. Uh, you can be hypomobile also when you have less. Um, I don't, 
there is, you can also, this is when it's in the bones and just range of motion in the bones. I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. I, I think that um, many, most dancers are hypermobile. The thing is they're also incredibly strong. They uh, develop their bodies in a way that they can use that hypermobility in a way that serves them. Dancers are, might be a difficult example because they have an incredibly difficult life and they use their bodies in very harsh uh, ways sometimes. And therefore, there is, um, there is systematic damage that can be done uh, to their bodies if they uh, keep on doing this for a long, long time, depending also on their constitution. Um, another problem that might arise is just that the conditions, the, 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 the physiology of your tissues can be soft can be people can have muscles that are have a lot of collagen those are the muscles that are, tend to be hard the people that tend to be stiff are people who have a lot of collagen in their muscles and you can have a lot of muscle cells in your muscle too they are the people that tend to be more flexible and more mobile are the people who have more muscle so if you have a lot of if your tissues are softer if you have a lot of tissue and you use and you you don't train your body you don't you don't uh, uh, generate strength in your body ever you just use it flexibility you can get too flexible in the sense that your chi your energy is not going to be flowing properly that's the thing we're always thinking about um, does your chi flow in a natural way for you some people are just more flexible than others i don't think you can get too flexible from yoga I don't think that that is true. I think you can maybe overstretch some tissues in certain areas of your body if you're not mindful. Uh, I had a student, for instance, who used to do a lot of saddle pose. She loved saddle pose. It's a yin yoga pose. And she was a runner and she noticed that she was developing a little bit of sensitivity in her knees. And so we had to work towards uh, making her saddle pose a little less deep. So, and then she was fine. So I think that you can have some reaction to a certain practice that you feel like okay because she was a runner she was stretching too much maybe if she would not be a runner she should not have had that problem i don't think you can get too flexible from just doing yoga because if you have that flexibility that is yours it's in your body but i do think that it's important to train your body to be strong not to be only flexible but to train your body to be strong as well uh you're yeah, very welcome she, she left natalie just sent me she was uh, she just thanked me for being there. So yeah, I do think that you can, you have to know your body. For instance, I am very flexible. And I know as I age now, that it's really important that I um, do strength training as well. I feel the need for my body to be strong. But, it, but I need to stretch as well. It's a yin and yang kind of thing. You And everybody needs different proportions of yin and yang, but they're both fundamental. All right. I think that was it. So if there is nothing else, I want to uh, thank you for joining us on our first Fat Yogi's webinar. <laughs> we had never done it before. I'm amazed that the technology of it worked so well. <laughs> um, I hope you guys um, enjoyed it, learned something from it. Ah, okay, Nicolette, thank you so much. Love you all. You too. Um, it's really nice to have you guys here, and I hope that we can um, leave it here. Thank you so much for the reason I have a yoga practice that works for me. Oh, that's what you want to hear. You know, that's how I started doing this. It's just, that's our motivation all the time. There's so much goodness in us that is not being used. You know, the world is being taken over by so much craziness and there is so much goodness in us and you can have so much pleasure in our bodies the bodies that we have you know imperfect and crazy and defective as they are we can have a lot of pleasure in them and also in our hearts and minds and that's a little bit of our mission here to see if we can unlock that in people so thank you so much for joining us thank you carrie for your help and uh, we hope to do more of those and if you have like ideas for uh, Things, things that you'd like to talk about or you have questions about, things that you want us to address, we can definitely uh, consider those. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste.